Wow, I can't believe this is the last one in our series, Learning to Fish. And I'm excited to finish the series up with you. Remember that one of the things Jesus has said is that his plan was to save us, to train us, and to send us out. Why, where, Christian, what are you doing, man? Oh, I'm just practicing my cast, that's all. Well, I, I hadn't seen you in at least two weeks. I, I, that was a pretty good cast. I, I thought that, uh, that you'd given up on the series. You were gone two weeks in a row. Oh, no, no. I, I've, I've, I've taken what you said very seriously, and I've been very convicted. If I want to be a part of a fishing club, then I need to learn to fish. You know, that does make sense. If you have all that knowledge about fishing, it seems like you really should use it somewhere. Absolutely. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm here to practice my cast so I can... Get to fishing. Well, that's impressive because I'm going to tell you, most people don't realize it. If you don't practice first, you're not going to be very successful at fishing. So I'm glad you're doing that. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you. When I started, I, I, I couldn't hit anything that I was aiming at. Um, but, you know, I, you just got to keep practicing at it. And, you know, I, I, need to, I need to get out there and get fishing. Yeah, you know, I've been fishing my whole life. And I still sometimes get a little rusty and I miss my spot or I'll get my hook caught in the tree behind me and so I know that that you have to do that so what's next for you well I think the the next step is I need to find some fishing holes (laughs) that's a good step well good fishing buddy I'm glad to see you're gonna do it we'll see you later oh one more thing preach the word absolutely (laughs) I've been waiting a long time to say that to him Well, good thing we got plan B up here. All right. So, you know, you have to be prepared. You have to practice. You have to think about it. So I have to tell you my story just from the other day. It's not that funny. (laughs) But, well, you never know. So, So I was at Jungle Gyms and wanted to buy some seafood. And I walked up there, and usually they're using the numbers, but I was pretty sure they weren't using the numbers because, you know, and and there weren't very many people around there. You have to go pull a tag. And there was one lady over there ordering a bunch of stuff, standing next to a couple. And then when he finished with her, I said, well, I'm next. And and I ordered my fish, and then I saw that couple come over here, and I realized, well, I'd cut line. And I said, I'm so sorry. Were y'all, were y'all ahead of me? They said, yeah, but it's no big deal. I said, I am so sorry. I thought y'all were with that lady over there. And I said, well, tell me, you know, uh, do y'all live around here close to Jungle Gyms? They said, yeah, we do. We live pretty close to here. And I said, well, what do you do? And she said, well, I, I'm at uh, Fifth Third Bank. And I said, yeah, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of, a Fifth Third Bank. But I'm getting used to this Ohio stuff. And, and she said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a minister. And I said, do y'all go to church anywhere? Well, we need to get back to going to church. And I said, well, well, tell me about that. And he said, well, we were both raised Catholic, but we weren't real crazy about where we headed. And and we've gone a couple times to Crossroads, but we need to get back. And I said, well, let me tell you about my church. And I told them all about our church and invited them. And then I went, I was really excited. And by the way, that's my new strategy for sharing the gospel is cutting line. (laughs) There's a couple couple good things about that too. It works two ways. So I went and told Monica, I'm so excited. I invited them to church. I realized, you know, I should have gotten their phone number. And I, I looked at my wallet and I thought, I need to have a business card on me. What am I thinking here? I was unprepared. So I almost got it right. And so I went back to look for them. They were gone. But I tell you all that to tell you that you have to be prepared. And if you don't get up every morning and pray about an opportunity to find somebody to talk to, it's not even going to cross your mind. It's just not. And this series, I hope, encourages you to be prepared and be thinking about what you need to do to share the gospel with others and to look for the opportunities. So that's a summary of some of what we've been talking about. But I want to talk about one methodology of fishing. You know, there's a lot of fishing in the future. I want to talk about fly fishing. There's a fly rod up here. And I love fly fishing. One of the ways that we need to understand is a way that Jesus used very effectively to preach is hospitality. Now, 
That was one of the main ways that Jesus went out and shared God or the good news of God with others. There were other ways. I know he taught and he had parables and stories he used, but one of the main methods he used is he went to other people's homes to eat. And that's why he was accused of eating with sinners and tax collectors. He said, you're just eating with sinners and tax collectors. And Jesus said, well, of course. It's because I've came to seek and save those who are lost. Of course. The, the, the well don't need a doctor. The sick need a doctor. Of course, that's what I'm doing. And we're called as Christians to use hospitality to share the gospel with others. And it was a lot more common than you realize in the New Testament that people used sitting around eating to share the good news. It was very common in the New Testament. That's why in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 25 through 29, talking about eating, here's what Paul says. All right, hopefully you could all hear that. And so look at what he says here in verse 27. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed, you're, you're open to going to eat with them. When you sit down, don't question what they're serving, and the context here is meat sacrificed to idols. And, and so don't make a big deal about it. Eat it without asking any questions because when you eat with them, it's a chance to share the gospel. Don't be uppity about it and go, well, where did you get that meat? I may not eat with you. Instead, just sit down without asking any questions and eat with them. And so that was one of the advice that Paul gave to Christians because they were expected to be invited to people's homes. They were expected to go and do what Jesus did and eat with tax collectors and sinners. In fact, if you think about the ministry of Jesus, often it wasn't on his terms, but it was on other people's turf. It's easy to have hospitality. Well, come to my games, come to my house, come to my church, come to my Bible study. But Jesus went to their homes, to their streets, to their parks. Jesus went where they were. And we're called not to selfishly make hospitality always on our terms, but to follow the example of Jesus and go eat at their house, go to their events, participate in their life. It's not just asking them to participate in our life. And when you think about the way the Gospels describes the kingdom of God. Oftentimes, the kingdom of God is described as a meal. It's described as eating together. And that's the description that is given in the Bible of the kingdom. And we're invited to eat with God. And we're invited to the banquet of the kingdom to participate in the blessings that come from God around the table. And we're supposed to meet around the table with others to share these blessings. Now, our vision is living like Jesus by loving and serving all. And if we're going to live like Jesus by loving and serving all, we have to get involved in the lives of other people. And one thing that we need to remember is hospitality is loving people you don't know. It's loving strangers. In the New Testament, it's the word philoxenias. It's the love of a stranger. That's what hospitality is. It means loving someone that you don't know. And when you combine that word, hospitality or philoxenias, and you combine that with the teachings of Jesus, there should be no doubt left in your mind that as Christians, we're called to sit down and eat with non-Christians. We're called to do that. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, it says this. Hang on, hang on one second. 
Right, let's try that again. In 1 Peter 4, 7 through 10, with a microphone that works, <laughs> it says this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now, I realize that hospitality is also about being hospitable to each other. And in fact, in this context, you might argue that that hospitality may be more about what happens within the body, but it still means love of strangers. So I want you to kind of get your mind around this. That means that hospitality or the love of strangers has to be extended even in this body. Even among Christians, it means you don't just go out to eat with your family and close friends and people you know real well. That's not what you're called to do. You're called to find people that are sitting alone in the audience, people you don't know very well, people that are outside of your circle and invite them to go out to eat with you or invite them into their house. In Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 11 through 13, another reference to hospitality. Listen to this one. Be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Okay, he starts out with this word, don't be slothful. Let's just say it what it is. Don't be lazy, all right? Don't be lazy, but devote yourself to prayer and and be rooted in your hope and take care of the needs of the saints. But then also, he says, make sure that you participate in the love of strangers. In Philoxenius, make sure that you participate in hospitality is what he's saying. And we need to reframe our minds because I think in church, we just, we don't mean to, but we just tend to think of it internally as fellowship. And let's have, if we got some good preaching and good fellowship, we had church. Well, no, it takes more than that. If we have good preaching and teaching and fellowship and prayer and singing, and you go out and you invite strangers in, now I'm calling that church. That's what church is supposed to be. And we need to reframe in our minds what that is. A lot of people think, well, we can grow our church if we just get, you know, a younger preacher. Sorry about that. Uh, You know, a younger worship leader. Sorry, Mike. (laughs) You know, uh, and, and get some excitement going. Then we'll start attracting those young people. No, you know what? You don't grow by making what happens in here better. You grow by sharing Jesus better out there. And, and that's the way that God has called us to live. He's called us to share the gospel with cha- strangers, to share the good news of Jesus. And we need to make sure we do that. Now, here's another interesting thing about hospitality. So it's, it's loving strangers, even the strangers in here, and for sure the strangers out there. But guess what? Hospitality is also about loving God. Will you back that up one for me? Okay, hospitality is about loving God. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 25, 37 through 40. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So, so here's the question. Well, Jesus, he'd just gone through telling them that they had done all this. Well, when did we see you as a stranger or, or as naked or someone in prison? When did we see that? And he said, when you show love or hospitality is extended to the least of these, you've extended it to me. I want you to think about this for a second. Jesus says that when you extend hospitality to the least of these, you extend it to him and by extension to God. So what happens when you don't? 
What happens when you don't make room in your life for a stranger or you don't make room in your life for a prisoner or you don't make room in your life for someone that doesn't have friends or for someone that doesn't know Jesus? Then what are you doing? You're actually turning your back on God. We need to think about that. We, we think about, oh yeah, I want to love God, but we are turning our back on God if we don't do this. And we're called to extend hospitality to strangers. And when we do that, we're not just loving the stranger. Jesus says, you're loving me. It's something strange going on in Hebrews 13, one through two. He exhorts us to be hospitable to strangers. And then he says, some people by extending hospitality to strangers have unknowingly entertained angels. Angels. Now, you know, we, I know we get stuck with this material world that we can see and touch and feel, but there is a spiritual world out there. Don't we believe that? And there's a spiritual battle going on between the forces of good and evil. And sometimes things aren't the way they appear. And the Hebrews writer says that when you love strangers, sometimes you actually love an angel. So there's something deeper going on when we extend hospitality to people we don't know in our lives. We're called to do this. There's something spiritual about it. And when we don't, we're closing off something inside our heart that God wants opened up. And there's consequences to that. Now, how important is hospitality? In 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 2, Paul says this to Timothy about elders. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Now, this is about elders. We've already seen that any Christian, if you get a chance to go eat with a sinner, do it. Don't make a big deal about things. Instead, share Jesus with them. And so important is hospitality that Paul says, Timothy, when you go appoint leaders at your church, pick people, and there's a whole list, but I'm focusing on one of them today, that are hospitable, that reach out to strangers, that have them in their homes. Pick those sort of people because we want all the body to be that way because that's the way Jesus was. And so we want our leaders to emulate what the type of life and behavior that the whole body is supposed to be engaged in. And that's what we want them to do. And 1 Timothy 5, uh, 9 through 10, uh, interestingly, uh, they have a list of widows. So in, in the New Testament times, your husband earned the keep most of the time. And if you lost your husband, you couldn't even feed yourself. Uh, You had no way to pay your bills or earn money. And so the church oftentimes would have to support those widows. And it says, make sure that if you're supporting a widow, that she's not young and going to remarry. And also make sure that if you support the widow, that she's godly. And one of the ways you know is it's a widow that is hospitable, that has shown hospitality to others. That lady is worth supporting. That's how important hospitality is. Now, one of the ways that we want to show hospitality in our church is home groups. It's not the only way. And one of the things we need to remember and reframe in our minds is we don't want home groups just to be about this internal fellowship with people I've known for 20 years. That's not what God wants any group to be, uh, this group or our home groups. He wants our home groups to always be aware that we're supposed to be extending hospitality to those who are not Christians, to those who are strangers, to people that are outside of our group or people that are new here. That's what home groups should look like. Now, I know some of y'all are too busy to get involved in home groups. I understand that. You've got a lot of kids games. You've got a lot of things going on. It's hard to host a lot of kids in your house. Well, I'm going to tell you home groups are not the only way to, to, to practice hospitality first. But I, let me tell you this. This is really important. You are not called by God to be required to participate 
and our home group ministry here at this church. But everybody in this church is called to practice hospitality in your life. So you may not do it in home groups, but you better do it somewhere. That means if you're not going to do it in home groups, take people out to eat with you after church. If you're not going to do it in home groups, invite a guest to come to your soccer game and talk to them about Jesus while your kids are out there picking the flowers off the ground (laughs) or scoring goals or whatever your kids do. But we need to make sure that every single one of us make room in our life for hospitality. Mentor someone, join the chess club. Even if you're horrible, it doesn't matter. You'll make more friends. But whatever you do, find a way to add people to your cliques. We are cliquish. We are cliquish. It's human nature. I'm not saying it's bad. It just is what it is. But here's what's bad is if your clique never grows. If your clique never reaches outside of itself. If your clique doesn't somehow offer hospitality to strangers. Now that's wrong. And so we need to make sure that we all find a way to practice hospitality. That's how important it is. And by the way, hospitality affects us eternally. Listen to Luke chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors lest they also invite you in return, and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So there's two points here. The first is just don't just invite your clique. Don't just invite your cousins and your brothers and your uncles and aunts or, or the people that your kids grew up with their kids. Don't just invite family and friends. Invite all of these people because if you just invite your friends, well, you're just like everybody else out there in the world. And you're doing it because it feels good and you're doing it because that's the group you're comfortable with and you're doing it because that's your reward. But if you do that, then that's your reward. But instead, he says here, go and invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind who can't repay you. That won't be your reward, but you will be building a reward, a much better reward and a lasting reward. And I'm going to tell you from my experience, when you invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the stranger into your house and into your life, and you're willing to go into their life, you're rewarded now and later. It's just the lie of Satan that tells you that you'll be happier if you just stick around with your friends. That's not even true. God will bless you on both ends of that. But if you want to build rewards, there's only one way to do it. And that's to invite in the person, the person that is a stranger. Now, he goes on in in, uh, 16 through 21 and listen to what, well, 15 through 21, listen to what he says. When one of those reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Okay. Now, listen to this. Somebody came to Jesus, heard this, said, Yeah, isn't it going to be great for all of us who get to be at at the banquet with God someday? Isn't that going to be great? The kingdom of God as people eating together around the table? That's how the Bible describes it. And listen to what Jesus replies to him in 16 through 21. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I, I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled, 
and blind and lame. So the problem is we all have a lot of good excuses. And I know, I know when you have your kids in your home, it's a big deal. I know that, that it's hard to get your house ready. I know that. I know that, that we come home from work tired. I know that when you're retired that you're just tired. I know, I know. There's always something, right? There's always something. But, but God says that if we have excuses, he's going to shut us out. He's going to invite somebody else in. He'll use some other church. He'll use some other group because God's work is going to go on. It's a matter of whether or not we want to participate in it. That's the question. But we are sacrifice averse. All of us. We want to, some of you are so good at planning your schedule that you've learned to plan it with your break times in it. And you learn how to get as much done as possible without sacrificing your comfort. That could be me. Hey, it works pretty good. I get a lot done. I work in all my comfort zones. But as Christians, we're called to sacrifice, to give something up. And, and sometimes that's hard for us to do. This is uh, the Castellan family. And this is probably from about, who knows, 1974 or five, maybe. And that's in front of the church that in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that my dad helped build that Monica and I hope to see on, on March the 20th. And so the gentleman right there in the middle is Wilson Castellan to his right or your left is uh, Dona Vera. Dona Vera, his wife, and behind them is their eldest daughter, Maria Lucia. And on the left, the tall guy with the long hair is Savadio, who played professional soccer for a little while. That's a big deal in Brazil. And right next to him is his little brother, Artur. And then next to him is his sister, Monica. And I had a crush on Monica when I was in eighth grade, and so I married a Monica. I don't know how that works out. And then uh, Oscar. And so... Let me tell you, uh, they had the School of Bible in downtown Brazil, and, and uh, Wilson is a lawyer that graduated from the most prestigious law school in Brazil that's right there in Sao Paulo. And he uh, saw the School of the Bible in downtown Sao Paulo and started attending classes there. And Johnny Panisi, who is a good family friend and a good friend of my father, she's about 91 right now and still living, studied with him for about two years. And and every once in a while, when they had all the missionary uh, teams get together, about 13 of the men would get together. He'd say, oh, I've been studying with God for like two years. And I'm worried I might be wasting my time. Should I quit studying with him? And, and they said, well, Johnny, does he seem interested? Does he want to keep studying? Yeah, he seems really interested. We ought to keep studying with him. Well, one day, Johnny uh, came back to the States for a little furlough. And my dad took me and we went to this little church where they had the School of the Bible in downtown Sao Paulo. And he responded to the gospel. And so did I at eight years old. And I was baptized the same night that Wilson Castellan was. Both of us baptized by my father. But let me tell you why it took him two years to make a decision. When Wilson Castellan decided to become a Christian, he confessed that 40% of his income came from illegal activities in his law firm. And they, it was pretty common in Brazil, but it was illegal. He gave up 40% of his income, sold a really nice house, moved into a small house and sold his car so he could become a Christian. What have you given up? It's just too easy for us to think we can have everything and think we only have to give God the leftovers. And they, they moved into a small house about four blocks from where we lived. And for five years, we went with our little Volkswagen combi. For five years, we picked that family up every Sunday and crammed them into our, our combi from age 9 to 14. They went to church with me. We need to understand that God calls us to sacrifice and he's not asking a lot from you. 
He's not asking you to give up 40% of your income. But you have to ask yourself, what are you going to inherit? What are you going to inherit? And so in Matthew 19, and this is the story, by the way, of the rich young ruler. The, the rich young ruler comes up. And the rich young ruler says, you know, what good thing must I do because I want to be saved? And, and Jesus tells him, and he says, I've done all that. And he says, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything you own. And he thinks, man, that, I own a lot. That's going to be tough for me. And he went away discouraged. And Peter and the apostles saw it, and they were discouraged. Well, that's, I mean, are we all going to have to be perfect? And, and, and they said, we, we don't know if we can do this. And, and Jesus says, well, with men, that's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And, and then Peter says, well, we've given up everything Jesus, we've given up everything. What are we going to get? And Jesus says to him this in Matthew 19, 27 through 30. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. A hundredfold what you give up, Jesus will give you in return. A hundredfold what you give up. And that's what God calls us to do is sacrifice. So now that I think about it, I probably could have ended the sermon right here. That's what Don Moore would tell me to do, and he'd be right. But I have something else I want to share with you before we end this series because we're transitioning into a new, a new time here called March Missions. And uh, Mike will tell you a little bit about it at the end of service. And so one of the things about our focus on missions, and of course we have uh, Kumo and Midwestern and Panama, but we're fixing to start a new one in, in Brazil. And one of the things about our missions in Brazil is it's going to be an opportunity for us to sacrifice for people that really want to know Jesus and that are easier to reach than some of the people we meet day in and day out. And I want to share with you a little bit of the story of the church that we're going to partner with there called Campo Grande, and it's the downtown church there. And that church is going to partner with us in supporting and sending four missionary families to Boa Vista in northwest Brazil. This church, though, is in southwest Brazil, and it was started in 1981 or 82. And I want you to know a little bit about the story of this church that we're going to partner with. And this video you're going to see is about Karen and Eugene Goudeau. And they led that group down there. And Dale Brown will be on there. It says former Brazil missionary. He wasn't in the original 13, but he joined my parents' team down there. I knew his kids. They're a little younger than me. Uh, this is the church we're partnering with and how this church started. My story began in missions and with Eugene in 1973. We were both part uh, of an international campaign with students from Fried Hardman and Harding University. Uh, we were on the plane that night and when the person next to me got up to socialize with friends, Eugene came in and sat in his seat and we visited throughout the night. We married the next summer. Eugene had always been interested in missions. Uh, he tells the story that when he was a little boy, he listened to a song uh, called Faraway Places and would dream of going somewhere. At about 13 years old, I had the thought of, of mission work, although I had never met any missionaries. So I really feel like God uh, called us to do mission work. In 1978, Eugene and Karen Godot and the team that they were working with to uh, find a place to come in Brazil uh, approached Gulf Coast Road and 
set up a survey trip to choose a city, and uh, we had four cities on the list, and Couple Grady was not one of them. And uh, we came as representatives of the mission committee, and we stood on that corner right over there. At the end, we took a vote, and it was unanimous that Campo Grande was the place that God was calling that little team to. We arrived in Brazil in January 1981, and our team consisted of Jeff and Suzanne Custer, Jeff and Pam Burton, Billy and Kathy McLean, and Eugene and I. We began uh, meeting in our apartments the first year or so, trying to learn the language and get used to the culture. And then we found a storefront that was fairly close to the School of the Bible. Uh, the School of the Bible was a, a place that we set up so that people could just walk in and, and study. So they went there in 1981 and started this Campo Grande church and what an incredible success story it was. Uh, not only did they build that church and there were no churches of Christ when they went there, but now there's eight churches of Christ in that town. And we're partnering with the strongest one there to go and plant these churches in Boa Vista. But one of the key converts was uh, a man by the name Zanata, and that's really his last name, but they go by his last name, which is Zanata. And his wife's name is Layla. And he owned a bicycle shop. And one of the things that Eugene did when he was in Campo Grande to meet people, he went everywhere on his bicycle. And since Zanata owned a bicycle shop, he met him in this bicycle shop. Listen to them tell you about how Eugene helped lead them to the Lord. Eugene met Zanata as he was out and about downtown. Zanata owned a bicycle shop. And uh, Eugene would, would see him and speak to him, and, it, and Zanata was easy to talk to. Eu conheci o Eugênio pela primeira vez quando ele entrou na loja minha de bicicletas. Ele andava pela cidade de bicicletas e resolveu fazer um reparo. E aí, nesse reparo, a gente conversando, e aonde ele chegava, ele oferecia estudo bíblico e fazia convites para para conhecer Jesus e no primeiro contato ele já me convidou e os contatos continuaram e um dia eu fui até a casa dele participar de uma reunião de estudo e foi assim que foi crescendo a nossa nosso relacionamento nossa amizade foi desta forma and he was uh, Zanata was so interested and, and Eugene would return every time so excited about having spent the time with Zanatha and Layla. I think there was a lot of deep conversation, but a lot of laughs as well. They really enjoyed each other. E ele ia na minha casa uma vez por semana ensinar a Bíblia. E eu sabia o quanto custava de hora, de combustível, e eu queria pagar as aulas dele, porque eu gostava da aula, mas eu queria pagar. E ele nunca aceitou. E aí um dia... É, eu insistindo, eu falei, olha, se eu não puder pagar, eu não, não vou mais ter aula. E ele falou, aceita que um dia você vai pagar muito, <risos> muito mais bom. do que você está querendo me pagar hoje. <risos> e eu fiquei... I love that. One day you're going to pay a lot more than what you're wanting to pay me right now. You know what? God asks for everything. And Zanata, by the way, they decided to start a preaching school. And, and they couldn't find anybody to run it. And so they called Zanata, Dale Brown, the, the elder at Golf Course Road Church Christ you saw earlier, called Zanata and said, have y'all found anybody to run that preaching school yet? And he said, no yet. And he said, Zanata, why don't you run it? He said, well, I never thought about that. And Zanata sowed his profitable bicycle shop that he'd owned for 22 years and became the director of Sercris, which means be like Jesus or be Jesus. He became the director of that school to train people to be preachers. And they also use that to give uh, Bible school training to college students that are attending the university there. And so the Gudos were there 15 years and then he had planned to be there 15 years and had this successful mission work and they went back to Midland in their home church at Golf Course Road Church Christ and he, he, he was missing Brazil and he was called the Zanatas all the time and by the way the Zanatas 
uh, I'm going to meet them, uh, God willing, we will worship with them next Sunday. And, and I'll bring you hopefully a report back about that meeting. We're going to meet uh, three of the four missionary families. He's setting up my itinerary. He's retired from uh, running that preaching school now. And so he has plenty of time and he's setting our agenda for the whole time we're there. I don't even know what it is yet, but he's setting it up for us. And we're going to meet with different people from the church. But Eugene and Karen Gudeau came back to the United States, but Eugene missed the mission field and decided he wanted to go back to Brazil and plant another church. And he was riding his bike all the time. And one day, early in the morning, Karen got up to study the Bible with her kids. And Eugene hadn't come back from his bike ride. And so they studied the Bible. And right before the kids left the church, a, a, a church family came running into their building, into their home, and said, We're sorry, but Eugene was hit by a car while he was riding his bicycle and died instantly. But why a reward he built in heaven before he went. And I, that we all might be as ready as Eugene is. And they interviewed all, this whole film was done after Eugene's death. That's why you don't see Eugene talking in it. But I want to show you one more little clip and we're going to be done. And this is the Zanatas uh, talking about their final conversations with Eugene before he died and sharing what he meant to their life. Às vezes ele ligava pra gente E a gente aproveitava cada minuto daquela ligação Porque era muito caro E numa das vezes ele falou pra mim Eu quero voltar Ele ia voltar pra Dourados Que é uma cidade perto daqui Eu quero voltar Eu quero voltar logo Porque meu lugar é com gente Falando de Jesus Não é dentro de uma sala Não é com reuniões Não é mais estudo, é com gente na rua, nas, no, é, ao lado falando de Jesus. Então eu sou muito grata, Eugênio. Um dia eu quero perguntar para ele também. Eu quero um dia encontrar ele no céu e agradecer. Eu sou muito grata. Aquele homem que falou de Jesus porque um dia um homem teve a coragem de atravessar a barreira dos não <laughs> one man had the courage courage to cross the barriers of no and it made an eternal difference in their life and in his. Jesus didn't call us just to sit around in here and be comfortable. He didn't call us to just fellowship with each other. Jesus called us to catch other fish. Jesus called us to sacrifice so that we can enlarge the kingdom of heaven so that we can all someday be there together sitting around the table of the kingdom with the people that we brought in because we cared enough and sacrificed something to share Jesus with others. I know it's hard. I know it's not comfortable. But with Jesus, all things are possible. Let's surrender our will, our church life to Jesus, and let's be fishers of men. Let's stand and sing.